Throughout the day, you kept us safely. You kept us well, Lord. And I bless you, Lord, for those who hunger and thirst, Lord, for your truth. Those who spend time studying, Lord, that they may be approved, that we may be approved, Lord. Uh, approval that comes of you that tells us that 
We're doing things that are pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. As we've made it to this hour, Lord, we bless you uh, for this opportunity. We come before you, Lord, humbling ourselves, just asking you to, Lord, first forgive us for anything we've done or said or thought, Lord, or left out, omitted, Lord. Uh, have mercy on us. Forgive us, Lord, for our shortcomings, our failures, our sins. Lord, that we may have a rightful fellowship with thee, and that we may be able to come into your presence in a confessed way. I bless you, Lord, for everyone who's tuned in. I pray your favor upon their homes, Lord. I pray your favor upon their family, their children, Lord, everything that they do. I pray that they prosper day and in the name of Jesus the Christ. I bless you, Lord, that you kept us from the ravages of this plague, Lord. we uh, going about your business, Lord. And as we go about your business, we lean and depend on you to trust, uh, trust you, Lord, to help us, to keep us, to sustain us, Lord. I bless you for this awesome privilege, Lord, of coming before your people to share in your word. Help me, Lord, and enlighten my heart and my mind that Lord, I don't lead astray, truly, Lord. I desire to walk uh, in an orderly way before you. And the desire of those who spend time in your word, Lord, is that they walk orderly as well. And so, Lord, we can't do it without you. Lead us, guide us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Good evening. Good evening once again uh, to our Tuesday night word study. Uh, we are continuing to embark upon the study of the book of Acts. And here in the book of Acts, we are learning how the disciples, the true disciples of God, are willing and able to persevere and to continue to be the uh, witnesses that God has called us all to do and uh, called to be in spite of uh, complications that may arise because of uh, personal problems, uh, circumstances, uh, in spite of anything that may come into our lives to hinder us. And we've learned that the power of our witness is strengthened as we learn to walk together in accord, in true fellowship. Uh, all of us are trying to get to the same end. We're striving in the name of Jesus. Isn't that something? We want the same thing. And so that should inspire and encourage in us a desire to walk as the disciples we see in the book of Acts, having all things in common. One Lord, one baptism, one faith, one God, one Christ, all the same. And as we see ourselves serving the same God, believing in the same Christ, walking with the same spirit. It should help us, propel us, and compel us to do so in a way in which we show forth the accord, the association that God requires of us. Uh, he's given each and every one of us a task to do. And, and we don't all have the same gifts and talents, but we have the same spirit that works in, works in and through us. We serve the same God who shared a common grace and a common mercy in all of our lives. And so this should help us to be able to work together. And as we work together, we can accomplish that which God has established for his church. That's all of us. It's not the one of us. It's not a certain group of us. It's not based on our uh, social uh, status not based on our racial status. It's not based on our economic uh, status. It's based on our desire to do all things as unto the Lord. And that's what this study, I I'm loving this study uh, because it's compelling me to look at myself and see where I fit uh, in the overall plan of God. And as we just figure out, he reveals to us and shows up, us what our plan is. And then we learn to work together with others who God has given a purpose and a plan. And, and then we find ourselves being, uh, as the scripture says, fitly framed. I'm doing my part. You're doing your part. 
all of us working together in the arena of life that God has given us, being those kind of witnesses. And we see when we do those things, God will divinely establish for us a time, a place, and a person to witness to, to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. But tonight we're going to be, be looking at uh, verses 9 through 27. Um, and uh, in these verses, we're going to be looking at three things. Number one, uh, the removal of personal bias. Two, the removal of personal doubt. And three, we'll be looking at um, how it is, if we can get past those two things, we'd be ready. We'd be ready to uh, be a personal witness and provide revelation to somebody else. Uh, killing, defeating the killer seeds in the church. We don't want to be that person who's the cause of confusion, the cause of contradiction, the cause of con uh, contention, the cause of complacency or compromise. We don't want to be that person. And that's what Bible study is all about. Us taking a look at ourselves and see how it is that uh, we're stacking up in terms of the order that God has established for his church. Our God is a God of order. And he's called us to be a people of order. And a people of order don't cause confusion, contention, or contradiction, or complacency, or compromise. We don't do those things. And it, and it helps us when we have a body around us uh, to help us to be policed, to help us to maintain control, to help us maintain the, the edict, the commandment of holiness and righteousness that God demands and that God has set forth and shown us. We follow his example. And as we follow his example, the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we find ourselves being able to assemble together, work together, to look out for each other, where we all have all things in common. If I have a need, if you have a need, all of us have been given something to cover one another. Isn't that, isn't that a novel thing? The scriptures tell us that love covers. You know what? Look, on a cold night, there's nothing like a nice, warm blanket or comforter to cover you and to keep you comfortable and to keep you warm and to keep you embraced. That's what covers does for us. And if we do those things to one another, for one another, then we'll find ourselves being able to together weather any storm. We're learning that these disciples had this in common. And then when one got in trouble, all got in trouble. When one had a need, those who had looked after the needs of the one. This helps us in our witness. For the world is looking at the way we love one another. Jesus said the world would know that you are my disciples. You follow me based on the way you love and care for one another. So it's a fantastic good evening. God bless you. Amen. So looking at the scriptures, point number one, uh, point of emphasis number one is removal of, of personal biases. Now remember, uh, uh, this centurion, a Gentile, uh, a man who God had designated uh, to be included into the, the family of Christ into the nation of believers into the 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 assembly of the saints uh, God had worked on his heart God saw that he was a devout man God saw that he was a caring man and God saw that he was a praying man the only thing that he had didn't have was a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and God is establishing this for this man and he's going to use one of his disciples. We've been talking about quite a bit that for every prepared heart, God has a prepared witness. That's you. That's me. And we should be ready, instantaneously ready to tell somebody of the liberating good news found in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so 
know that. I asked last week as we are as we are sharing tonight. Uh, if, if be if you if, if you're so inclined, just share on the timeline someone that you, you had you had an opportunity to witness to over the course of this week. Amen. Okay, so we see this prepared heart in Cornelius. And now God has a prepared witness, but God has to get this witness readied up to go and do and proclaim to this man the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, starting in verse number nine, we look at nine through 16. We, we see this written. It says, on the morrow they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city. Peter went up, on, up, up on, upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descended unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is not common, that is, common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God has cleansed, that call not thou common. 16. This was done thrice, three times, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. And so what God is doing here is removing from Peter a personal bias. Now, Peter's bias in this instance was based on uh, the, the law, the word of God, which said you can't eat unclean animals. And God had defined those animals that were unclean. And so in this instance, he was, he was showing Peter and he shows us. He said, look, I can call it unclean, but if I tell you it's good for you, if I can tell you it is good to consume, if I tell you it's good to consume, then you have to remove any personal bias that there is. You see, sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes there's a tendency to look at people based on how they dress, based on what they live, uh, where they live, based on their lifestyle. And in looking at such, we tend to forget all of us came out of unclean situations. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And God is saying, you can't call somebody else something that I delivered you from. He said, you don't have that right to call anybody or anything unclean. I alone establish what's clean. I alone establish what's holy. I alone establish that which I will be merciful and graceful toward. And so God is working with Peter. He said, I got to get these personal biases out of you. And, and if we'll be honest, if we don't have them now, praise God. But there have been some times when we've looked at people and said, no, they're not ready. Some folks have said they had a certain calling on their lives. And the first thing that comes to mind sometime from the self-righteous, from the holier than thou is this. Man, I know what you just came out of. Man, I know how you live. I, I, I Look, like Jesus telling the woman at the well, yeah, you're right. You don't have a husband. Jesus has a right to do that because only Jesus has the power and the authority to forgive and remove the stench of sin from somebody else's life. Oh, we can forgive, but we can't remove. So God is saying, look, there's somebody I'm going to send you to. It's the same thing that uh, Ananias had, had with Paul. Paul was a rascal. And I say that but then again, all of us were rascals. Paul did some unsavory thing. Paul did some hateful thing. How many of us will admit that we have done and sometimes still do unsavory, unrighteous, and unholy things? But yet and still sometimes we, we, we can't see beyond the moat or the plank that's in our own eyes because we're too busy looking at the moat in somebody else's eyes. And so God is telling Peter in this instance, hey, you don't have a right to be biased. 
You don't have the right to be prejudicial. You don't have the right to try to define whether or not somebody else is acceptable. I, I always think of this, and I mention it quite a bit because it's amazing how God's grace is. It is said that Jeffrey Dahmer confessed Christ before he died. There are some people who might think, well, you know, he, he couldn't have been saved. Jeffrey Dahmer, he, he was a homosexual. Jeffrey Dahmer, he was a murderer. Jeffrey Dahmer, he was a cannibal. And, 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 and we are not too careful. We have to admit that we're thinking, no, 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 not Jeffrey, Lord. Anybody but Jeffrey, he's done. But there is no sin except the sin of blasphemy that God is not willing to forgive. We like to say, I'll forgive you, but I won't forget. That's not the way God operates. God says, I forgive and I cast your sin in the sea of forgetfulness. Meaning, he's not going to hold our sins against us. And so how dare we hold somebody else's sin against them? And so God is in establishing his witnesses, and he's doing this for us through Peter. He's saying, don't try to judge other people, judge in terms of, of c condemning them. That's not our place. That's not our right. That's God's prerogative. And so we've got to be loving. We've got to be kind, and we've got to be accepting. Paul, I mentioned, was was, was doing some harmful things to, to the body of Christ. And God sent this man to saints who he was killing, who he was prosecuting, who, was, who he was putting in jail in chains. But God converted this man on a way to do wrong. And I always say this, where were you when you got saved? What were you in? How were you thinking? How were you living? I'm speaking to myself as well. I know how I was. I know what I was. And I'm so thankful that he was able to look beyond my faults. Well, he can look beyond my faults. He can look beyond anybody's fault. That's why I always say I agree with Paul. There's none worse than I. Chief among sinners. When we're able to denigrate and put ourselves down and, and humble ourselves to the point where we acknowledge how foul we were and how foul we can be, then how can we think, dare think any worse of anybody else? Until you put your biases aside, no one gets a chance. The man on the cross, at first with his fellow man on the cross, they were mocking Christ, but he came to a point where he recognized that he needed Jesus. And on that very cross, he confessed Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to that man, this day you'll be with me in paradise. That's what we're all looking for, to be with him in paradise. And so Paul, God showed Peter all of these unclean situations, these unclean circumstances. And he's going to do, and he is doing the same hallelujah with you and I. And he says, you got to get beyond your personal biases. Never, ever should we put ourselves in a place where we dictate. And we have too much of that in the church nowadays. Let's just be honest. There are too many people in the church. The one place where the lost ought to be able to come and find refuge. But we have too many people in the church who think that they have arrived and it is them and them alone, like, like Donald Trump. I alone am worthy. No. no. We're not worthy. It's Jesus Christ who's worthy. And he makes us worthy by, he's made us worthy by the sacrifice that he, he made. I didn't die for anybody. I have not shed any blood for anybody. Even if I had, my blood would not be worthy to save a single soul. And so we should not be biased against somebody else. Point of um, emphasis number two. Uh, God says we have to remove first the personal bias. He said we got to remove next uh, the personal doubt. 17 through 20 reads as follows. 
Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. Remember, Cornelius had dispatched some devout people to um, go to find Peter because that's what the Holy Spirit had revealed to him. Send for Peter. Peter has a word for you. And he does, think about it, he does the same thing with us. He sends providentially people into our path, people into our arena, people into the space that he has established us in, or he'll send us to them. And we have to be ready to give them the testimony. The man in the middle of the desert reading that word, but he just couldn't understand who is this man? Who is this scripture talking about? Is he talking about himself? And Philip had to say, no, he, he talking about Jesus. That's what you and I do. Tell somebody all about Jesus. But you can't talk about someone that you don't know. And I don't mean no of. We talked about that last week. No of versus uh, knowing, having a personal relationship with, with them. And all of us should have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that relationship compels us to witness for his namesake. And so here Peter was and he was thinking on the vision and what it meant. And behold, 19, three men come to seeking him. 20, arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing. For I have sent them. Peter, I sent them. Here God is saying, you got to remove the personal doubt. God first told me you have to remove his personal bias. Now he's saying you got to remove the doubt. And in order to do, do that, you've got to know that the voice of God is whispering in your ear. How does this happen? You have to have first a personal confession, a personal conviction. And that personal conviction stems from your personal relationship, your personal confidence in Jesus Christ. Remember when Jesus was asking all the rest of the disciples, who who folks saying that, who are the folks saying I am? And, and they said, well, some call you a liar, some call you Jeremiah, some say you just like one of the other prophets. And then he said, who Peter, do you say I am? And Peter, out of a personal conviction, and we have to have that personal conviction because th that is the basis of our personal confession. He said, thou art the Christ. Thou art the son of the true and living God. That's what we have come, that's the conclusion that we have reached. And because of such, we believe in it with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and we invest all of our strength in him. Personal conviction. And then you got to have a personal commission. Once you have a personal conviction, Jesus knows that he has you. He knows that you've yoked yourself voluntarily to him. And, and, and he gives us a personal commission. Matthew 28 talks about that. He told his disciples, all power, all power in heaven and earth. I've been given that. And with that power, I commission you and what was the commission? Simply one word, go. He didn't say, ask me where to go. He simply said, go. I'll tell you where to go. And he said, you got to go. Preach and teach. You got to go. Baptize in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost. He said, go to the highways and the byways. Go to the far reaches of this world. Tell anybody everybody. Don't be worried about whether they receive it or not. Just sow the word. And I'll be the one who bring forth the increase. So uh, ready to provide that removal of the doubt says you, you got to have personal conviction, personal commission, and then a personal commitment. Do all that's unto the Lord. Other folks may not believe the way you believe, but as long as the Holy Ghost is guiding you and leading you. 
stay close to your commission. We had a discussion in our Sunday school class this weekend, and the comment was made that, you know, people in the church are following folks in the church. That's where you get in trouble. That's absolutely where we get in trouble. We do all as unto the Lord. And if the leaders are not, are not following and living the examples, you need to know that. Well, how do you know it? The Spirit bears witness of itself. God will tell you who it is. And so we can't let friendship and kinship move us into a place where we're in compromise. Remember, that's one of the killer seeds. And where we become contentious and contrary to the word and the will of God. So, removal of the doubt. That's what he's telling Peter. And, and as Peter was, was this is another way God is so awesome. As Peter was contemplating this, these very men came, showed up at his front door. And when God does stuff like that, uh, uh, are you going to doubt any longer? No, we are people who move in, record, in accordance to the movement of God in our lives. So first, removal of personal bias. God will take that away. He'll show it to you. Removal of doubt. And lastly, uh, we see that if you can be moved from your personal bias, if you can be moved from your personal doubt, then you are ready to provide revelation to someone else. Um, 21 through 29, read notes and we'll finish for tonight. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? 22, and they said, Cornelius the centurion, centurion, a just man, and one that feared God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house, and hear, to hear words of thee. God has given you and I the words of life. This is why Peter didn't desert Christ when all the rest of them were. When Jesus said, will you go away too? Peter said, you know, who else are we going to go to? You have the words of life. And he has imparted the words, hallelujah. He's given the words of life to us. What an awesome privilege that you and I have been entrusted to tell somebody else about the goodness of God. We don't have time for the, all, all the tomfoolery. We don't have time for all the fussing. We don't have time for all the fighting. We have been given words of life and we need to be sharing words of life and not living in strife inside the church. Bless you, Lord. And so he, 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 he tells them, I, I've sent these folks to you, Peter, and I've given you something to help them. 23, then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Y'all know I love that word certain. <laughs> certain. He didn't define them. He didn't describe them. He called them brethren though, meaning they were men and women who knew the Lord. Yeah, if you're going to go be a witness, don't, don't take any hell raisers with you. If you're going to go in the room and pray over somebody, don't take any doubters in with you. Don't take any unbelievers in with you. You say, well, how do I know? You know. You know. They show themselves to be who they are long before the opportunity arrives. When you go and you call on somebody to go with you, make sure it is someone who's going along and they are ministry Minded. Keep that phrase in mind. Ministry minded. It's all about doing the work of the Lord. So uh, 24 and the morrow they, okay, read that. Yeah, no. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and their friend. And as Peter coming in, was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. It's not about us. 
It's all about Jesus Christ. And he talked with him. He went in and found many that were come together. It wasn't just Cornelius. It was his family. And it was other people who've been waiting on a word from the Lord, who were waiting to get into a relationship with the Lord. They just didn't know how to do it. I want to share this with you as we close. And, and you need to bear this in mind and keep this in heart. The Bible says, how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, let me tell you the misconception most people have when they read and they hear that scripture. They think the pastor. They think a minister in the pulpit. No, every one of us are ministers unto God's grace. Every one of us is a witness. Here's a preach, word preacher defined. A preacher is an evangelist. A preacher is a missionary. A preacher is a minister. A preacher is a herald. A preacher is a proclaimer. A preacher is a publisher of the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Well, the truth that we know, if it liberates us, it can liberate somebody else. Stop telling folks, let me, let me get my pass online. You better be ready. That's why you're studying, so that you can witness, so that you can declare. It's nothing complicated. Just tell somebody who set you free. Just tell somebody who changed your life. Just tell somebody who righted you in your mind. Just tell somebody who fixed, uh, tell somebody about someone who fixed your heart. Jesus did it. Jesus did it. Jesus did it. And if he did it for you, he's ready, ready, willing, and able. He died not just for you. He died not just for me. He died so that everyone would have a chance. Just tell them that, folks. Tell them that out of conviction. Tell them that with passion. Tell them that with enthusiasm. But don't just tell them that with your lips. Tell them that with your life. So Peter showed up and they, they saw Peter and they were so glad. These, these folks, here it was their confidence. God through the Holy Spirit had revealed to them that you're ready for my kingdom. And God through the Holy Spirit had revealed to them there's a man by the name of Peter, and that man knows the way to everlasting life. Send for that man. Remember, we talked last week about follow through. Cornelius followed through. Peter, even though he didn't quite understand everything, he followed through. And you and I, we have to follow through and then just open our mouths and tell them all about the Lord. Okay, uh, where we stop. 28, and he said unto them, you know how that it is unlawful thing and, 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 and unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. God has shown me. God has shown you. God has shown this wretch that we are not fit to call somebody else unclean or uncommon. No, it's not our place. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying. I didn't hesitate. As soon as I was sent for, I asked therefore for what intent ye have sent for me. Peter says, here I am. Now, the ball goes to Cornelius' court to show forth. He and all those folks were gathered. Why are you sent for me? And you have to be prepared to respond to that in kind. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. He's talked to us tonight about, uh, as, as we witness to those in this world, that we have to make sure that we have no personal biases. We have to make sure that we don't have any doubt. And we have to make sure that we embrace the call of Christ to be a preacher, to be a teacher, to be a witness, and be prepared to baptize new converts and believers into the body of Christ. Praise God for you. Went a little longer tonight, but uh, I, I thank you for your patience. 
And, and I know you've heard something that's good because we went through the word. I know you've heard something that you can share. And I just ask this of you. Be assured and convinced in and of yourselves and be ready for that moment when God will establish you. You don't know when it's going to come. You don't know where it's going to be. But we don't have to worry about that. God said you don't have to rehearse it. When the time comes, I'm going to tell you what to say. And so we don't have to depend on ourselves because it, because it is not up to us to change someone's life. It's up to us to publish, to cry aloud, to witness, to evangelize, and to preach the word of God to those who are hungry and thirsty for it. God bless you. God loves you. And this wretch loves you too. Have a great night. Amen.